Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Micah. You guys are rocking with me on Micah's Intellectual Corner, or I guess today we can go ahead and say Gemma Pell Micah, since we are continuing our epic history TV Napoleonic Wars epic, with today we're doing the Battle of Jena and Aristide of 1806. With that being said, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. With that, we're just gonna go right into it. Let's roll. An Epic History TV History March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. In December 1805, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, won a crushing victory against the joint forces of Austria and Russia. Napoleon now dominated Europe, able to hand out spoils as he saw fit. In February 1806, he sent an army led by Marshal Massena to overthrow the King of Naples, who had dared to side with his enemies, and gave his throne to his own brother Joseph instead. Another brother, Louis, was made King of Holland. His German allies, Bavaria and Württemberg, were elevated to the status of kingdoms. While Napoleon made himself protector of the Confederation of the Rhine, a new alliance of German states that would contribute 60,000 troops to his army. In recognition of the new reality, Emperor Francis of Austria formally dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, founded by Charlemagne a thousand years before, but now without influence or purpose. Austria. Real quick too, um, just so you know, everybody knows, Emperor Francis actually, his order to dissolve the Holy Roman Empire was actually, uh, it was actually illegal under the, uh, the Reich law, I believe. People in the empire already uh, kind of wanted it dissolved. By the time the Napoleonic Wars was over, I believe, this is why it was never you know, resurrected. It was the fact that, you know, they had, a, it was a patchwork of administrative structures and overlapping jurisdictions that kept the, you know, I, in my opinion, you know, don't take it from me, that kept it from, you know, being resurrected. Charlemagne a thousand years before, but now without influence or purpose. Austria had been humiliated. France remained at war with Britain, Sweden and Russia. But in the summer of 1806, all eyes were on Prussia. The Prussian king, Frederick William III, regarded Napoleon with deep mistrust and had been about to join the coalition against him when news arrived of its disastrous defeat at Austerlitz. He was heavily influenced by his wife, the celebrated and popular Queen Louise, who detested France and Napoleon. She led the influential war party at the Prussian court. Matters came to a head. I feel like uh, I led the war party and all that stuff. I really, he means belittled and, you know, essentially called weak. Maybe, I don't know, as a married man, I'm just saying, <laughs> but yeah. Matters came to a head over Hanover, a German state which had belonged to British King George III, been occupied by the French and given by Napoleon to Prussia as compensation for other territorial changes. Now the Prussians learned that Napoleon had secretly offered to give Hanover back to Britain in exchange for peace. Frederick's advisers now persuaded him that war was the only honourable course. But Prussia then made a basic strategic blunder, sending an ultimatum to Napoleon without consulting its new allies in the Fourth Coalition. Their forces were too far away to help Prussia, who would now face Napoleon's Grande Armée with just the small state of Saxony for support. In 1806, the Prussian army had a fearsome reputation that dated back 50 years to the reign of Frederick the Great. Napoleon, a student of history, regarded it with respect. 
But Prussia's army had been allowed to rest on its laurels. Its generals were old. Its staff work hindered by bureaucracy and personal rivalries. Its movements ponderous and predictable. Prussian soldiers, however, could be relied on to fight with pride and determination, while Prussian cavalry was regarded as amongst the best in Europe. In October 1806, Napoleon invaded Saxony. It almost kind of sounds like, you know, 1940s Italy, a little bit like how they, how Italy was plagued with, you know, poor equipment and uh, bitter officer rivalries and stuff that hindered their advancement in the military wise. But, you know, even Heinrich, Him Heinrich Himmler said, you know, or marveled at how how uh, their fighting spirit and how good at, they were actually fighting given the right uh, leadership and stuff like that. It kind of sounds like that, maybe a little bit, but I don't know, maybe I'm uh, reading a little bit into it. In October 1806, Napoleon invaded Saxony with an army of 166,000 men and 256 guns. Advancing in three columns, the French crossed the mountain forests of the Thuringerwald, along roads carefully reconnoitred by scouts and spies. Napoleon intended to threaten Leipzig and force a decisive battle with the Prussian army, which he believed was near Gera. The Prussians were, in fact, further west, concentrating near Erfurt, on the west bank of the river Saale. Its commander, the Duke of Brunswick, had hoped to threaten the flank of Napoleon's advance. But wrong-footed by the speed of the French, he now ordered a retreat north to find a new defensive line. On the 10th of October, at Saalfeld, Marshal Land's Five Corps clashed with a Prussian advance guard commanded by Prince Louis Frederick, the King's cousin. The Prussian force was routed, and Prince Louis himself killed in combat with a quartermaster of the French 10th Hussars. Yeah, because I was about to say, even with all the French, you know, spread out, that they're still able to traverse over that terrain as quick as they're able to with their, their corps and their armies broken up the way Napoleon has them broken up at this, at this time. Awesome. But... The Prussian force was routed and Prince Louis himself killed in combat with a quartermaster of the French 10th Hussars. Three days later, Lan made contact with a large Prussian force near Jena, and sent news to Napoleon. The French Emperor, <coughs> believing he'd found the main Prussian army, rapidly issued orders for his corps to concentrate for battle at Jena. Bernadotte's one corps and Davout's three corps were to cross the Sala and fall on the Prussian flank from the north. But Napoleon was wrong. Lan faced a 35,000 strong Prussian rearguard, commanded by General Hohenlohe. The main Prussian army, 52,000 men under the Duke of Brunswick, was further north moving straight into the path of Davout's Three Corps. The Battle of Jena began at 6.30am on the 14th of October, in thick fog. Marshal Land's Five Corps already had a toehold on the plateau west of the town and river. His first task was to drive back the Prussians and win room for the rest of the French army, arriving by the hour, to deploy. His infantry led the way, and fierce fighting broke out for the villages of Kospeda, Krosowitz and Lutzeroda. Meanwhile, Augereau's 7 Corps advanced through a ravine, emerging onto the plateau on Land's left flank while Sultz, four corps, climbed steep tracks to form on his right. Napoleon joined Lan in the centre of the battlefield, 
organising a 25-gun battery to support the attack on Wetzenheiligen. The village was won, but then lost to a determined Prussian counterattack. On the right, around 10 a.m., Sult's infantry secured Klosowitz, but was counterattacked on its right flank near Rudigen. A decisive charge by Sult's light cavalry drove off the Prussians, routing their infantry and capturing two enemy colours. As Six Corps began to arrive on the plateau, its fearless but impetuous commander, Marshal Ney, ignored orders and dived into the fighting around Wurzenheiligen, becoming briefly cut off by a Prussian counterattack and having to be rescued by guard cavalry. General Hohenlohe was expecting the arrival of 15,000 more troops under General Ruschel at any moment. Until then, he remained largely inactive shoring up his line and ordering limited counterattacks. Okay, a few things right now. So, first of all, all of this makes me really want to play some uh, Total War with the Napoleon one. Just really makes me want to play right now. Second of all, one thing I, I noticed that he said was colors. I'm not sure how much you guys know what colors are, but pretty much those are like the guidons, the flags. Um, apparently they ca captured some Prussian, uh, you know, flags and that mean in if you don't know those mean a lot to uh in the military if you lose those that's like yeah that's unforgivable but so that means a lot so with that and but, third of all it's funny because even nowadays if you see a, if you would have a commander or a, a general or anybody do something that we just saw here where they essentially ignored a command and then they went charging into so whether the ambush and then have to get their their butt uh, saved, you know, that'd be cause for either demotion or uh, I would say court martial or something. But you know, I'm sure something happened. Uh, obviously, something happened. I'm sure I will hear it in the comments. And for whoever lets me know, I do a thank you. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get back into this. Shoring up his line and ordering limited counterattacks, but he had run out of time. Napoleon had begun the day with just 25,000 men. By 12.30, a steady stream of reinforcements had brought his strength up to 96,000. As the Emperor rode past the Imperial Guard, one young soldier, eager to be sent into action, called out, Forward! Napoleon stopped and demanded to know who had spoken, then rebuked the soldier as a beardless youth who ought not to offer advice until he too had commanded in 30 battles. First of all, I feel like even in the military, I feel like a period as a whole around the world and for, you know, eons, this has probably been a problem where you'll have a, a young a young private, so to speak, been in a year, probably even less and less, because in these times I feel like it was probably like months and then you'd go right into it and they don't really know and understand the gravity of war really and what they're really about to see and what they're really about to get into. It always smacks them in the face as soon as they realize what they're really just signed up for or what they really just got conscripted for, or whatever. But yeah, I think this is, you know, that's a very interesting story though, at, for the very least. So, but you know, let's go ahead and get back into it again. Hunted in 30 battles. But the moment had arrived. Although the guard, to its frustration, remained in reserve, the other French corps were ordered forward in a general attack. The Prussian army began to give ground. At first it kept its discipline, but then disintegrated into a general rout. Murat's cavalry were launched in pursuit, riding down and sabering hundreds of fleeing Prussians. General Ruchel's two divisions finally arrived, at the worst possible moment. They briefly held up five corps' advance, but were soon outflanked, broken up by cannon fire, and charged down by French cuirassiers.
Meanwhile, 12 miles to the north, near Auerstadt, Marshal Davout was marching southwest, expecting to fall on the Prussian left wing at Jena. Instead, he encountered the Duke of Brunswick's main Prussian army, heading north to take up new positions. Davout's three corps, 27,000 men and 48 guns, was about to face odds of two to one. While Bernadotte's one corps, which had orders to support Davout, was nowhere to be seen. Davout, nicknamed the Iron Marshal, showed no signs of alarm. He formed his first division into a defensive line centred on the village of Hassenhausen, his infantry forming squares to repel a series of cavalry charges by General Blücher's advance guard. His other two infantry divisions arrived to strengthen the line, standing firm in the face of repeated Prussian attacks. But Prussian movements were slow and poorly coordinated, nor did they use their numerical advantage to try and outflank Davout. At a crucial moment, the Duke of Brunswick was shot through the eyes, a wound that proved fatal. King Frederick William himself took command. Several Prussian units remained uncommitted, but the King, convinced he faced the main French army under Napoleon, dithered. Around 1215, Marshal Davout counterattacked. The Prussian army turned and fled. Davout had won a stunning victory against the odds, but at a heavy price. His corps suffered 25% casualties, one man in four killed or wounded, while inflicting twice as many losses on the Prussians. It's really crazy, um, you know, seeing in this battle, seeing it, you know, obviously with an overhead view, you can see the incompetency, oppression, the lack of training. You know, even even in today's military, you know, training is like number one. You have to, is should be muscle memory, you know what I'm saying? And as we saw in our last video with the training tactics, with a lot of these different movements and tactics, you have to have muscle memory to do it under fire. Otherwise, I mean, you can see, you see what happens. Let's get back to it, guys. While inflicting twice as many losses on the Prussians. When news reached Napoleon, that Marshal Davout had engaged and defeated the main Prussian army. He reacted first with disbelief, then heaped praise upon the Iron Marshal, later awarding him the title Duke of Auerstadt. Marshal Bernadotte, in contrast, was nearly court-martialed for failing to support Davout. Napoleon's army began a masterful pursuit of the beaten Prussians, giving them no time to regather their strength. Two weeks after the twin battles of jena auerstadt Napoleon's troops, led by Davout's heroic Three Corps, entered Berlin. The next day, General Hohenlohe surrendered at Prenzlau. At Lübeck, General Blücher and 20,000 Prussians were driven out of the city in heavy fighting and forced to surrender. While 25,000 Prussians besieged at Magdeburg surrendered to Marshal Ney. Prussia's army had been devastated by a Napoleonic blitzkrieg. In just 33 days, Prussia had lost 20,000 dead, 140,000 prisoners, 800 guns, and 250 standards. It was a humiliation that proud Prussians like General Blücher would neither forget nor forgive. I'm really surprised that the Russian people as a whole from this didn't like revolt because, you know, obviously looking back on the video, it almost seems like this didn't have to happen when all all the king had to do was 
wait on his allies, Russia and Sweden, to come down probably maybe a month, maybe two. Obviously, I don't think he had that much time, maybe uh, realistically, but still, let's finish this video out. That proud Prussians like General Blücher would neither forget nor forgive. Unlike Saxony, King Frederick William refused to make peace with Napoleon. He continued to hold out in East Prussia, trusting in the approaching Russian armies to rescue his kingdom. Despite another glorious victory for Napoleon and the Grande Armée, the war was not won yet. Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military commanders of all time. But who were some of the worst? Alright guys, we'll go ahead and stop it right there. So yeah, there we have it guys. The Battle of Jena and Arstad. I'm, 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 I can't say this, with these words. I have freaking peanut butter in my mouth. It feels like half the time. But yes, of 1806. Guys, if this type of stuff doesn't get you in, compelled into history, I don't know what will. I mean, this is like soap opera in real life. I mean, like, it's so compelling to me. It just, you know, gets me, you know, reveling in, in history, world history, military history, all that stuff. But with that being said, thank you guys for joining me once again on this episode of Micah's Intellectual Corner. Please don't forget to like. Don't forget to comment a suggestion of a video that you want to see me react to. If you guys like my content, please, please, please subscribe. That being said, thank you for joining me. I'm out. Peace.